Hi, Presto English learners. I'm Marcus, and I'm back with special content to improve your vocabulary level in the SUPIB exam. Those who are aiming for nine or above should be at least familiar with these expressions because you're likely to use at least half of them. So sit tight, take notes, and practice. What's good is here in this video, I'm going to show you not only the correct examples but also common mistakes that people make when they use them. A little word of caution before we start. I'm not a fan of simply memorizing words and phrases. I've said that over and over again. I want you to really understand how the expressions that we're going to learn are used. Otherwise, you use the expressions in the wrong context. I've seen people who did that, and they made strange sentences. In that case, your vocabulary score will suffer. Only when you understand the usage, you'll be able to make great sentences that make you sound more like fluent English speakers. And we didn't just pick these expressions out of a hat. We picked the ones that fit the topics you get in SUPIB. I'm sure you learn a ton from this clip, so please like this video. That way, we know that you find this video helpful. And don't forget, subscribe to Presto English as we'll continue to post more content like this to help all of you with your test preparation. Number one. I suggest or I recommend, and you can add an adverb in between. The most common ones would be highly or strongly. So we'd say, I highly suggest or I strongly recommend. This expression is super useful because you can use it in different tasks. Of course, this works in speaking task one, giving advice, but it also works in some other tasks. There are two basic forms that you can use, and please listen carefully. Because this is one of the most common mistakes I've seen people make. Let me show you the wrong example first. I suggest you to talk to my friend Jeff. No, that's incorrect. The right form is either I suggest you talk to my friend Jeff, or I suggest talking to my friend Jeff. The verbs suggest and recommend are called subjunctive verbs, and they're followed by a clause or a noun or a noun phrase, which is why we use the gerund form, the verb ing. Okay, I know this is just our first expression, but why don't you make some examples and leave them in the comments? I think it's a great way to practice. Number two, the if clause. We'll discuss briefly the three common forms. I'll outline the format here on the screen. So we have conditional type one, type two, and type three. There are also the combinations, but to make things simple, we'll just talk about this three. Conditional one is used when we're talking about the present and the future. But then conditional two is also used when we're talking about the present and the future. So what's the difference? The difference is with conditional two, we're talking about a situation that's unlikely to happen, whereas conditional three is used to describe a past event. The common error that I see is that people use the wrong tenses in their sentences. I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but if conditionals are、uh, a grammar concept that's so confusing to you, tell us in the comments so maybe we can make a video on conditionals in the future. But I want to show you some brief examples on how we might use this in the exam. I can say, well, if that doesn't work for you, why don't you talk to my brother? He should be able to help you. Or if I were you, I would not go there. I'd rather stay at home. If you had told me earlier, I wouldn't have made a promise with my friend. If I had known, I would have told you right away. Now let's go to our third expression. It's very simple. It starts with "let me." All right, we can say, "Let me tell you about something. Let me tell you a time when something happened, or let me describe, or let me explain something." This one should be pretty obvious, but I just want to again point out the common mistakes that I see every so often.、Uh, some people would say, "Let me explain you something," but when you use "explain," it should be followed by "to." For instance, "Let me explain to you why I say that."、Right? If I use "Let me explain you," I mean that's a rarely used format, and it sounds unnatural to our ears. We should just say, "Let me explain to you why I say that." And when we use this "let me" statement, this is also an opportunity to paraphrase the topic, which is something you're encouraged to do in the exam. Don't be lazy and just use the exact same words as the question.
And now, number four, adverbs of location. In task three, and maybe in task four,、um, you're describing something that you see. If you don't know yet these adverbs of location, take the time to memorize them and practice them. And know the prepositions you need to use, and don't mix them up. You know, for instance, we say in the background instead of on the background. And here's one common error I noticed.、Uh, sometimes people use the the phrase to the left rather than on the left. These two are not talking about the same thing. If I say on the left, as in on the left side of the picture, I'm talking about the left portion of the picture. But if I say to the left of the man, for example, I'm talking about what's beside the man. Accordingly, to the left of the picture refers to something that's beside the picture, but it's outside the picture. So for task three. If I say to the left of the picture, that just does not make sense. Here's maybe a、uh, picture that can help you remember some of those adverbs of location.、Uh, I know the the use of prepositions are quite confusing. Sometimes we don't know if we should use in, on, or add. But all it takes is just some time to practice, some time to remember, and you'll be okay. Number five. Well, this is not exactly an expression. But we need to know how to state certainties and uncertainties. In simple speaking, you'll be presented with various situations, so there will be times when you need to use this. So why not practice those if we know we're going to use them? For certainties, we can say things like, "It's likely that I'm sure. There's no doubt. I don't see any chance. I bet, etc." And then those expressions will be followed by a clause. But for uncertainties, you're going to use expressions like, "I'm not sure if you're going to like this idea. It may or may not work, but it's worth a shot. I can't guarantee this will work, but I can tell you that I don't know if this is the right thing to do. I can't say everyone else will agree, but..." and so on. In real life conversations, we do use these kinds of words, even though your sentences may be perfect grammatically. Adding expressions like this. Uh, we'll add points to your vocabulary. It makes the sentences a little more natural. So you guys who are watching this are probably about to take the self-help test very soon. So I'd like to remind you that you can get help directly from me by joining our seven-day online self-help training. You can do this training anywhere because it's online and the timing is flexible. So even if you have a full-time job, you can still participate as long as you're willing to take the time to study. You get customized feedback based on your responses. So sign up today at www.prestoenglish.com, and I'll see you in our next training session. Now let's continue with our sixth expression, which is rather than. At times, you're asked to state your preference or your choice. This is where the phrase rather than come in handy. There are two ways you can use this. One, rather than followed by a noun or a noun phrase. For instance. I get a new phone rather than a new notebook. Another way is to use rather than followed by bare infinitive, or maybe the ing if you use it as a preposition as opposed to a conjunction. Here are the examples. Rather than study at home, you should just go to the library if you don't want to get distracted. I prefer to move to a condo rather than a townhouse. Where people get confused is usually the form of the verbs, so be sure to study the forms. And since we're talking about rather than, we might as well talk about with rather, which has the same meaning as prefer. It's followed by the bare infinitive, which is you know the infinitive without to. So I have two examples here. I'd rather move to a condo than a townhouse. I'd rather quit my job than apologize to her. Now let's move on. For the subhip test, you want to be able to contrast things. This is one of my favorite types of sentences to use in the test. You have to know how to contrast two things. I guarantee that you could use this somewhere in both speaking and writing tasks. So, to contrast things, we can use again phrases like "despite the fact," "even though," "while," and before we move on to the next expression. Again, this is another common error I see very often. If we already use one conjunction showing a contrast or indicating a contrast, there's no need to add another one. 
but unconsciously we may add a second one. So there is no need to do that. If I say, even though I have time, but I prefer to do something else, that's not right. We just say, even though I have time, I prefer to do something else. Number eight. So we've got three more to cover. Here is number eight. As far as I'm concerned, don't you get tired of saying, I think? Well, this is one way to say it differently. I'm sure a lot of non-native speakers don't use it or are not even familiar with it, but it's still fairly common to use. After the phrase, you will just continue with a clause. For example, as far as I'm concerned, living in Canada is better than living in the U.S. It can also be used to replace words like with regards to or about. So here's an example of the application. As far as money is concerned, you don't have to worry about me. If I say that, I'm saying that you don't need to worry that I might get into financial trouble. Okay, now it's your turn. A lot of people are taking the SELPA test because they want to immigrate to Canada. So why don't you tell me your opinion about living in Canada and use this phrase as far as I'm concerned. Again, you can leave your opinion in the comments. Nine, before I give you the uh, expression, in task three and task eight, you have to describe a picture, right? So what if you see things that are not familiar to you, but you should want to mention it somehow? Well, you're in luck. Here, I'm going to give you some words. So this is not just one, but some words that you can try to use in case something like that happens. Of course, the ideal scenario is you can explain everything clearly and precisely, but that's just not always possible. So I have a picture here. So I'm going to use this picture to maybe make some examples of the sentences that I want to show you. So here are a few phrases you can use. We can call an object a thingy. Here's the example. It's a brown thingy that you can wear on your hand. Or I can say some sort of. It's some sort of a wheel, except it's not perfectly round. Another one, kind of. It's a kind of a beer holder in the form of a glove. Or we use the word resembles to um, compare it to something that looks similar. It's a pattern that resembles those you see on sweaters. Another one, it seems like or it looks like. If we're talking about the appearance, I can say it looks like a winter glove, but it's not exactly a glove, of course. Or I can't tell. This is just a guess. I can't tell if it's made of cotton. Number 10, this is something that you're likely to use in speaking task one and maybe writing task, sorry, speaking task eight and maybe writing task one. And of course, all of you are familiar with this, but first let's see the expression. Um, I'm writing down two here. I'm calling two and I'm writing two. So why do I mention this here? It seems very familiar. It seems very common. Well, let me show you the wrong way to use those. If I write, I'm writing you because this is awkward. In North America, we either write, I'm writing to you because, or I'm writing you this email, because in task one, we're writing email. I'm writing you this email because something. On the other hand, with the verb call, we should not say, I'm calling to you too. We should say, I'm calling to, or I'm calling you to. So I'm calling to ask you a question. I'm calling you to ask a question. Okay, so I've shared with you 10, or actually more than 10 expressions that you are likely to use in the SELPIB exam. What do you think? Hit like, give us a thumbs up if you think this is useful, and click subscribe because next we're going to talk about idioms to use in the test. Yes, idioms. So anyway, what's shared in this video is super important. They're not difficult, so take the time to practice. Don't make mistakes when you use them. Thanks for watching. As always, I'll see you again real soon with another video from Presto English. Bye.